for those who can't make it with us today. Um, so like I said at the beginning, today is uh, just a kind of open discussion, um, as will be both sessions for the week, uh, in which we have an opportunity to gain some needed clarity on some questions or problems which are at this point uh, still undeveloped or obscure. Um, so we can kind of jump around at this point. Um, uh, the four philosophers that we've worked through, so Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and Hegel. Uh, so we don't have to necessarily go all the way back to Plato, but if you guys have some questions about that, if you've taken some time to look at um, the reading guides, that is the lecture slides, or perhaps some of the um, one or more of the prompts that connect to that and open up some questions for you. We can talk about that stuff. Um, but um, are there any, so I thought one way we could go about it is first spend some time with the prompts of the midterm and just the formal expectations and, and requirements for this assignment um, to make sure that everyone understands that what's expected. Uh, and then we can just kind of jump around the texts. And I have certain questions or certain problems, certain areas of the philosopher's arguments that we should focus on that uh, we didn't have time in the preceding weeks to deal with in any satisfying way. But other than that, it's, it's gonna be open to you guys for whatever we talk about. Um, so before I share the screen and we go to the midterm prompts, are there any kind of general questions or ideas that you guys have in terms of how you want to spend the time for today or this week? I uh, I might lose reception here in just a second, but I'll log back on uh, in a moment if I lose you. <clears throat> no, all right. So I'll share the screen and we'll take a look together at the guidance for the midterm paper. All right, so the midterm, again, it's due this Sunday by midnight. So by 11.59 PM, that's Sunday, May 16th. So the task is to write a three to five page paper. Um, so some of you I know are familiar with the process of putting together arguments and uh, formal philosophy papers, but many of you are not. Uh, so for, for the latter, for those uh, for whom this is a sort of foreign or daunting experience, uh, this discussion will be helpful, I think. So uh, the task is a three to five page um, assignment in which you respond to one of the following prompts. And so here are the criteria the criteria by which you'll be evaluated. And I also provided a rubric to help you in that area too, in terms of figuring out what counts as, um, as a successful paper in terms of these very cri various criteria. Uh, but I'm looking for faithfulness to the text. So the accuracy, in other words, of your interpretation of what the philosopher is presenting in the form of an argument, a claim, um, a concept, a question, or whatever the case might be. So faithfulness, faithfulness to the text is a criterion by which um, I'll be brought to understand to what extent you have um, substantively engaged with the thinking of the respective philosopher and have an adequate grasp of the substance of that thought. Uh, and then strength and clarity of argument so I'm, I'm looking for an argument as uh, constituting um, the central crux of the paper, which means there should be some overarching claim or conclusion that you are advancing through the course of the paper and that you will be defending by appeal to uh, certain premises, uh, that is certain points of, of justification or thematic support. So that's the second criterion, strength and clarity of argument. So in terms of what your major claim is, did you substantively defend and uh, um, provide reasons for that claim or that position? 
And three, style and structure. So here's where I'm looking for uh, grammatical precision, um, spelling accuracy, the presence of a clear thesis statement in which I see what will, will amount to or what your argument will, will uh, amount to through the course of the paper. Um, it should be, so here are the sort of formal or stylistic requirements. Um, it should be typed double space, of course, you're turning it in online via Moodle, uh, 12 point font. So it should also be proofread, spell check, and in conformity with MLA style guidelines. Um, and it should be uploaded by May 16th, 1159, so before midnight. So I give you a series of five prompts. Um, and two of the, the five have to do with Plato, and then the remaining connect to Aristotle, Kant, and Hegel. And so you'll just pick one of the five prompts and respond to it as adequately as you can, um, satisfying all the elements of, of the question in a three to five page paper, right? So again, just for clarity, you don't have to um, answer all of these questions in a three to five page paper. It's not possible, uh, I would argue. So really just one of these prompts. And so the first prompt, um, again, related to Plato. So what according to Plato's dialogue ion is the nature of artistic inspiration? How does artistic inspiration relate to art? Uh, so which is a translation of the Greek techne, a form of knowledge as we've, we've talked about. So what is the connection of techne to what we now understand to be knowledge or refer to as, as knowledge in contemporary discourse? So do you find Socrates' answer to Ion's question satisfying? Why or why not? So of course, if you choose this prompt, you have to articulate what Ion's question is and then give some sense of, of what Socrates' response to that is and how that brings into thematic relief uh, the answers that you might provide in terms of these questions. So the nature of artistic inspiration, uh, the relationship between inspiration and art in the sense of techne and so forth. And um, feel free, I'm just gonna to go through and read all of these and then we can talk about them. But if a question comes up to you about one of these prompts, one or more of these prompts as I'm reading through them with, with you, just interrupt me and let me know and we can talk about it then. Uh, the second prompt, so explain in your own words, Diotima's account in Plato's Symposium so the first prompt has to do with the ion and the second Plato's symposium. Um, so explain Diotima's account of the nature of love, eros, and how love or eros relates to the beautiful in the Greek toagathon. Uh, what is the relation between the beautiful and the good in Diotima's speech? So these essential platonic forms, the beautiful and the good. Illuminate in detail the role of artists in the pursuit of beauty. So what exactly are artists doing in their peculiar pursuit of beauty? Finally, in what sense, according to Diotima's account, does the pursuit of knowledge or wisdom itself have an erotic foundation? Um, so where is, in other words, eros to be found or located within the, the very uh, condition of knowledge as such, the very condition of knowledge in terms of its possibility and nature. So that's the second prompt. And then third, and now we get to Aristotle. So what according to Aristotle is, or why according to, to Aristotle is all art, which is a translation again of techne, essentially poetic. And further, why is all poetry imitative or mimetic? According to Aristotle, how do tragedies, comedies, and epic poetry differ in their uses of imitation? Do they ultimately have the same goal in their imitation? Or must all three, so tragedy, comedy, and epic poetry, be judged by different standards? Um, so that's prompt three. And then we get to Kant in prompt four. So Kant makes a distinction between the pleasant, which is different for everyone, um, that is to say what counts as pleasant or what you enjoy or experience as pleasant is going to differ from person to person. Um, and the beautiful, 
which is not that way, right? So there's something universal about the beautiful. And this is the category for Kant of um, the subjective universal. So there's something that he characterizes in the terms of subjective universality when it comes to the experience of the beautiful. So judging something as beautiful is then um, as compared to the pleasant or the merely agreeable, judging something as beautiful is stronger claim. And so why? Why does Kant think that? That when you judge some phenomenon or object as beautiful, why is that a stronger judgment than when you impute something as charming or pleasant or agreeable? So think of an example to support Kant's idea that judgments of beauty are more universal than feelings of pleasure. Do you find Kant's argument convincing or is there some way in which it's problematic, which you find it problematic? And then to conclude, lastly, we've got prompt five bringing us into conversation with Hegel, our most recent philosopher. So why according to Hegel is art higher than or superior to the works of nature? And this is something that we talked about quite a bit last week on Thursday, uh, from what quote, universal and absolute need or want is the word used in our text, um, but it really means need. From what universal and absolute need does it spring? And how does that need connect it to all acting and knowing? How does Hegel moderate between those who say that art is merely a skill and those who say that art is entirely a production of genius and not a product of general human activity. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so are there any questions just at this stage that jump out to you from these prompts, from these questions? Is there anyone, anything you wanted to talk about? in connection to these prompts? Is there anything that needs clarifying? Well, how about this? I actually have to run to the restroom. I really have to uh, urinate. So <laughs> while I'm gone, instead of putting you guys in breakout rooms, we've got a really small group. Why don't you guys discuss together um, in each of your cases, what you plan, which, which prompt, at least at this point, you might not have, although you should be making it pretty soon, you might not have yet made a final decision as to which of these prompts you plan to respond to. Um, but as a group, you might just share with each other uh, what you're going to write about. And if you have some sense of your strategy in um, putting forth that effort, you might share uh, some insight in that direction with one another as well. So, and of course, you can kind of use this as a, as a small break too, if you need to, to run to the restroom or something, but I'll be back in just a few minutes. Um, does that make sense? All right, so I'll stop sharing the screen there and um, I'll leave you guys to just talk about this for a few minutes and uh, I'll be right back to hear what you've come up with. Um, all right, so I'll see you guys in a few. That was genius. Someone, anyone, tell me what you're thinking. I no. liked the first and the third prompt. Mm. Why? I think there's a lot you can go into when it comes to techne and mimesis. Um, we can also kind of throw in that argument of um, artistic beauty versus um, natural beauty, even though it's not like the same dude or whatever um, in the first and the third pump, but they kind of are interrelated. So. Oh, well, certainly. Like it's the same book, <laughs> if we're really. Yeah, definitely. Like trying to be real. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things from each reading. And so I don't see any reason why one shouldn't, you know, like throw ideas together just for the sake of making your personal argument about art. 
I, I for one, am like really excited for our next week on Nietzsche. And I don't know whether or not I should include anything about that in my paper uh, because no one has, well, like we haven't talked about it. So yet. Um, I'm, I'm thinking prompt three sounds pretty interesting. And just so, yeah, let's let's like get into it. Okay. Okay. So what are what are your guys' thoughts on prompt three? Why is all poetry imitative or mimetic? I think that in a sense, if we think about mimesis as not just being a property of art, but as being a, a pattern in nature, in, in being in general, uh, it, it makes perfect sense that like we as natural beings would seek to imitate. Um, yeah. And of course, I mean, not just reproduce, but you know, make something new that rhymes with the rest of the universe. Um, so imitation in this sense is not exactly what it sounds like. It can be, it's basically us taking aspects of something in real life or something we have seen and then just basically molding it into our own image. Sort of, yeah, I think so. There's... Yeah. Can that really be called imitation well, anymore? There's this question of what what is meant by uh, the translation, right? So like, what were they trying to get across? Like, what's the real meat of it as opposed to what's the specific um, case? Because we're kind of left with our own, uh, our own minds to interpret it with. So the, the, um, the imitative quality of what Aristotle was talking about might not be what, you know, the word imitation necessarily means to your average like modern day human yeah um and i usually th try to think of it in terms of just the word mimesis like mime um it, it it's just a, sort of a blank slate for me i guess so i don't ha have a lot of baggage with with it isn't isn't miming basically the practice of like silently copying the exact movements or abilities of someone else well sort of but if you think about it mimes are really sort of creating their own reality as opposed to just becoming whatever they're looking at you uh, know like the whole like wall thing like they're trying to break your perception yeah oh, interesting connection perhaps they know something we don't <laughs> and they will never tell you what it is yeah <laughs> right yeah, so think of mimesis in terms of when you're talking about miming here, but mimicry too. I mean, that's where we get, that's the etymological source of this language of mimicry. Um, and so <clears throat> we talked about this before, uh, and some of you might have read that short piece by Walter Benjamin, um, the sort of um, uh, mimetic faculty for Benjamin is, is about finding, uh, and we find some hint of this, as I suggested before in Aristotle's own approach, uh, is finding what Benjamin calls non-sensuous similarities between things. And so I used an example of, of um, how a child relates mimetically in just a, a moment of play with like a butterfly, <laughs> right? So there's something about how a child comes to terms with the presence or being of a butterfly by without any particular reason for doing it, sort of emulating the movements of the butterfly, appropriating them for the child's own self, um, thereby becoming more butterfly-like. And in that relation, the butterfly becomes in some sense more childlike, given that it's now uh, taken up through the act of play. So it's, it's now this sort of playful relationship between the butterfly and the child. And in that activity, the child learns something about what it means to be a butterfly, but also about what it means to be a human, what it means to be a child. Um, 
And so it's not it's simply mimesis imitation mimicry in the sense that the butterfly is this original cop or model and then the child is uh, responding to that model by copying it in different ways. And then you get these uh, static consequence or results that is model and copy. There's something um, of an expansion or augmentation of being in that relationship between original and um, response or uh, representation or something like that. Um, such that after we can witness the child's play with the butterfly, maybe we know something new that we didn't previously about the nature of butterflies and children and how humans learn from nature and so forth. And think about in technology too, to build on this idea of mimesis. Um, so uh, there's this term in contemporary disco discourse, eco-mimesis, um, where we are uh, through ecological of a kind, ecological practices, emulating phenomena within the natural world for an augmentation or expansion of our own being in terms of what's possible or what our capabilities are. So think about how historically the technology of human flight advanced. Well, it advanced um, originally on the basis of observations that human beings made about birds, for example, <laughs> and we imitated them. But by imitating them, we're not just doing what an artist, a landscape artist, for example, does when representing through paint, a visual medium, some scene out there in the natural world. When we participate in ecomimesis through technological development, such as that um, of the capability of flight, we are, by imitating birds, expanding our own being. <laughs> Um, so we are now human beings that are capable of flying when we weren't capable of flying before. So there's something in our imitation of natural phenomena like bird life that expands uh, what it means to be human, appropriating or incorporating into that nature or that essential identity qualities that were foreign to our human um, subjectivity or sense of being. Um, so. Uh, this is just to say that when we participate in nature mimetically, um, it's a kind of activity. And so this is the notion of mythexis from the Greek, uh, which Aristotle sometimes uses, but Plato used before him to characterize the relationship between um, per sensible particulars and the intelligible forms of which those particulars are representations. So one, uh, you might call it a shortcoming in Plato's own um, conceptual and thematic language through which he gives us in these various dialogues, the so-called doctrine or theory of the forms, one shortcoming that Aristotle would respond to in his own metaphysics is it's not exactly clear how generation is possible. So in, for example, the symposium, Genesis, generation, giving birth, giving birth in particular in beauty is talked about as an important process um, that involves universal forms and sensible particulars, but no real helpful details are given. So um, when we see a beautiful sunset, for example, we see that as a sensible particular, which somehow and Plato uses all of these different words in different contexts. The sunset somehow um, represents beauty. It somehow manifests beauty. It uh, participates in beauty. So that's the sense of mythexis, right? It participates in the form of beauty. It reflects, it manifests, it instantiates, it represents all these different terms, but there's something about participation in the sense of the Greek mythexis that's really important there. So there's a way in which every sensible particular isn't just a static copy of an original model, but it participates in the very being of that model. Um, <clears throat> but importantly, in a causally dependent way, just like if you're standing in front of a mirror, you might say that the mirror image is a copy or a representation of your bodily presence in such a manner that you couldn't have the mirror image 
without your bodily presence. Um, so there is a kind of necessary causal relationship there. But there's also a way in which your bodily presence or you as a body, as a subject, while looking in the mirror are participating um, in the copy. And the copy is somehow participating in the original such that you might see something on your face, for example, and wipe it off. <laughs> or you might think, I don't like the way I look. Uh, so I'm gonna put makeup on. So then the copy of your originary presence provides a kind of medium through which in a different way you can participate in the very being that's being depicted or represented. Um, does that make some sense? And so just to speak to Aristotle's approach here, um, so he found this uh, aspect at least of the Platonic doctrine of forms unsatisfying because it didn't provide any intelligible access into the nature of um, the structure of coming to be and passing away that involves a relationship between particulars and forms. And so one overarching question that remains open that is unresolved in Plato is how do the forms um, relate to, correspond to the particulars? So, um, if the sensible particulars are purely sensible, that is accessible by means of our uh, sensory equipment, and the forms are purely intelligible, that is they cannot be accessed by our sensory equipment, and they stand as the necessary causal condition for the very possibility of the manifestation of a particular in a human experience. Well, what is the relationship between these things? So you've got so-called Plato's heaven on the one hand, that's made up of the form of the good, the form of the beautiful, the form of the just and so forth. And then you have the sensible examples or particulars, which in these different ways, these different more means of, of description correspond to those forms. Um, but how does that work? <laughs> if you're dealing with entirely discrete that is separate or distinct orders of reality. So according to Aristotle then, um, the relationship between form and matter, and so this is something we talked about in the context of his four causes, is not a relationship between some um, super sensible, purely intelligible phenomenon that exists in some non-spatial atemporal domain, which has to inexplicably <laughs> connect to the physical universe that we occupy. Uh, for Aristotle, there seems to be no easy way to bridge that gap. So instead, um, the form is always inhering within the material substratum. So for example, for Plato, taking an everyday item like this, a book, uh, you've got the sensible particular, which I can encounter through the course of my everyday experience and recognize, oh, this is a book, but that's only because I'm cognitively appealing to the idea or the form of bookness, which prepares me in advance of seeing this object to be able to even recognize it as a book in the first place. Um, but for Aristotle, the universal, this um, whatness, as he puts it, right? So when we're dealing with um, universal forms and material sensibles, it's a distinction that we're dealing with between um, whatness and thisness, right? So when I look at this book, there is a whatness to it. And so when I ask, well, what is that? If I am maybe too far away from the object to with any clarity decide what it is that I'm seeing, or if it's maybe hidden under some cloth, I can't quite pick up on what the object is. I think, what is that? And if someone were able to tell me, they would say, oh, that's a book, right? That's the whatness of the thing. That's the universal. But in terms of the sensible particularity, in which case we're talking about this book and not, for example, this book, <laughs> um, the whatness question puts these two objects into a condition of identity or a relation of identity. 
but they're separated or rendered distinct by the materiality. So um, I'm not asking when I'm uh, requesting um, if I can't find it, my copy of, of Philosophies of Art and Beauty, I'm not asking the question of whatness, I'm asking uh, in which case any book would serve just as well as any other. I'm asking for this particular book. And that has to do with the sensuous materiality through which this particular object is manifest as something different from this particular object. So then for Aristotle, the universal form, bookness, is inhering in the matter, in this case, um, an assemblage of paper, glue, ink, and so forth. And that relationship for Aristotle between form and matter is, um, is one like, and he uses this example because for the human uh, um, organism, the form is the soul and the material. So the hule, the material cause is the body. And the soul is what as a unifying principle puts all of the discrete parts that make up my body into an intelligible system, right? Such that all the parts mean something vis-a-vis -vis each other in some functional deployment of what I'm capable of as the human person that I am. Um, but, and this is something interesting in Aristotle in his, his work De Anima, he says, um, and this is another point of distinction between Aristotle and Plato. For, for Plato, the soul, unlike the body, is immortal. And so once the body perishes, uh, the soul will go on. And death is simply defined by Plato as the separation of soul and body. Uh, but for Aristotle, since the soul is the form which gives unity to the organism and the body is the matter, uh, once the soul departs from the body, it dissolves, right? There's no place for it to go. And he uses the metaphor of a stamp. So if you have like an ink stamp, um, like a, a, um, a notary uses, for example, if you have to go get some uh, document officially notarized. Um, so they'll put a little stamp on there. Well, the stamp is like the form and for the form to even show up, to come to presence in its formness, you might say, it requires the paper. <laughs> uh, you can't have the image of the stamp floating around without the paper. So for that reason, Aristotle concludes that there is never form without matter, and there's never matter without form. So this is his conception, uh, his theoretical conception of hylomorphism, which means that every determinate entity that exists is a construction of, of matter and form, hule and uh, um, morphos, uh, which is the, the Greek word for not just form, but a kind of shapeliness or pattern. Um, okay, so does that, does that make sense um, for Aristotle? So then how does that relate to mimesis then in that prompt? Can anyone? maybe make a point about that connection. So what is what exactly, based on what we've said so far, clarified thus far today, what exactly is an artist imitating when producing say a tragedy or a comedy or an epic poem? So I'll ask the question in a different way, <laughs> maybe a, a simpler way. Judging by the theory of Aristotle's four causes, if you had to pick one of those four causes in, in uh, an effort to answer the question, what an artist is imitating, what would the answer be? Would that be the formal cause? Yeah, 
So can you give me an example from say a tragedy? So a poet who's writing a tragedy, a tragic poem, um, if the image, so if the end result, if the tragedy is an imitation and the imitation is always of a particular form. So how can we make sense of that with an example? What would the artist be imitating? The, the form of, I guess, something which has occurred, which was tragic. Yeah, and what are those specifically tragic emotions? Like grief, you might you might be trying to imitate grief as in like um, a story about something, you know, grievous happening, like Oedipus maybe. Um, although that might be discussed too. Like there's a lot of forms which one might pull upon to create a narrative that it is meant to invoke a lot of negative emotions. Yeah, so can it, does anyone remember? There are specifically two tragic emotions. Are they pity and fear? Right, yeah. Um, so then the artist, the tragic artist, the tragic poet wants to bring forth, so this is the originary or essential sense of poiesis, the tragic poet wants to bring forth in the affective life or experience of the listener, audience member, or reader, the tragic emotions of fear and pity. But interestingly, they are um, simulated emotions. And so it's only because of the representational or uh, simulated quality of these emotions in terms of how they can be elicited by a piece of poetry that's ineliminable because if a poet were literally to scare the shit out of the audience, <laughs> well, this would rather than facilitate, it would stand in the way as a kind of obstacle to the possibility of catharsis, right? So there has to be, and we find this retained by Kant and Hegel that although the artist is bringing about a form which in some sense appears natural as if it could have arisen out of nature uh, by um, natural forces as it were, or sources of production. At the same time, it has to be recognized as a work of artificial design. That is the, the product of an aesthetic endeavor on the part of an artist. Um, otherwise the experience um, is closed off, right? So. The artist has to navigate this kind of line. And we find that too in Aristotle, so not just in Kant and Hegel. So it has to be clear that what the audience member is viewing is not a legitimate scene of human life <laughs> and various actions and personages, but rather a representation. And this is something that we'll see next week when we turn to Nietzsche, the very origin of the stage <laughs> as we understand it, its role importantly in theatrical exhibitions, performances, musical performances, even in cinema, right? So the stage arose um, at the very advent of tragedy as a means of delineating the real from the ideal, such that uh, these tragic emotions and other such uh, products or objects of the pursuit of, of aesthetic presentation and experience can make possible. Um, and so the elimination of the stage then would be to eliminate, say, the fourth wall, as we use that language in theater, to kind of break down the barrier uh, between um, the space of ideation, the space of performance, the space of art, and the space of everyday experience. So uh, we find again and again, as we turn to these thinkers, these aesthetic philosophers, an important role for that uh, line of demarcation. Um, and we kind of talked about that last time when Raven brought up uh, the difference between like the original Lion King and the recent hyper real effort of the Lion King. It's kind of, um, you might say, breaking down that fourth wall. The hyper realism um, has the disorienting uh, 
or perhaps discomforting effect of, um, you might even call it a kind of uncanny effect of removing the aesthetic distance. Um, okay. So um, the tragic artist, the tragic poet wants to facilitate the simulated experience of fear and pity, these um, uh, paradigmatically or emblematically tragic emotions. And to do that, uh, different actions, and so this is something that Owen mentioned, so different actions, so the Greek word uh, Aristotle uses praxis is represented. And so a given human experience or series of actions is represented um, and the audience member is thus put in a position to feel or experience certain emotions. Um, but now this connects to Plato, the experience of those emotions then, since they're ideal, they're aesthetic, um, when you feel fear or pity in the context of a tragic performance, it's not the same as when you feel fear and pity in your ordinary everyday life. Otherwise, perhaps you couldn't learn <laughs> from the experience. Um, you would simply be buried in it, um, in the kind of overwhelming details um, that can push you in this direction or that. Okay. Um, but so we've talked a lot about mimesis already today, but are there any other comments or questions about that? But remember, this is in part what motivates the subsequent theoretical approaches to these questions having to do with art, beauty, and the aesthetic. Uh, because if you take something like architecture, for example, it's not immediately transparent or obvious what exactly one is imitating, right? So you might say, appealing to this concept of ecomimesis, that perhaps human beings are imitating uh, um, beavers who make dams or bees who make um, nests or birds who make nests or something like that. So that's one approach you could take. And um, also it's worth noting that in some subsequent sections of Hegel's lectures on aesthetic, on aesthetics, he, he makes the point that architectural columns um, such that you find in different epochs, taking on a different um, aesthetic appearance. Um, so um, columns that support edifices, different architectural structures, that the column, no matter how ornate or sophisticated, is really a representation of the original post, like a wood post, that the first creator of human habitation might have used. <laughs> so a post for example, uh, a vertical post um, standing forth from the ground and given to support the um, roof of a structure. Um, it can be found parallel to the walls, that that is originally, uh, so any columns that we have are just representations or imitations of the first post. But, um, so architecture though, it's unclear what's being imitated exactly and music too. So there's the point of discussion and Kant and Hegel actually replies to this. He, he thinks about this as well. He has some comments about this, about, of someone emulating a bird song. <laughs> um, so it could be that we emulate the uh, communicative or otherwise pleasant sounds of animal life as composers of music or something, but that's not exactly satisfying because as Kant points out, and this is what Hegel was remarking on as well, there's a kind of pleasure that we derive from the natural phenomenon of a bird producing a melody that would not be the same for us if we were to find that melody being generated by human imitation. <laughs> so if someone can really emulate the song of a bird, um, so I can call your attention to this part of the text. Um, it's really interesting. We didn't talk about it explicitly. Um, let's see. 
Where is it? I guess I can't find it as quickly as I thought. But did any, does anyone remember that part in Kant where he talks about bird song? Hmm. Ah, can't find it. I oh. found the quote. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Even the song of birds, which can be, which we can bring under no musical rule, seems to have more freedom and therefore more for taste than a song of a human being, which is produced in accordance with all the rules of music. So we very much sooner wary of the latter if it is repeated often and at length. Yeah, what page was that? I, I Googled it. I, I... Me too. <laughs> <Damn it. laughs> I mean, I have it noted in the text because I know I wrote a note about it, but I can't find it immediately. I think this is actually a really, like, just in general, like, it's a really awesome quote. So we might want to talk about that. Um, I find it interesting the way they idealize bird songs as being free. Um, when, I mean, if you think about it, it's probably just the only thing that bird has ever heard. And it's the only thing it knows how to do, really. Well, so what do you guys think about that? So Kant suggests, and Hegel agrees with him, um, that you can enjoy, you can find the song of a bird, um, a sustained and continuous source of pleasure. Whereas if you were to find that it's being uh, simulated or, or represented by a human who perhaps developed a tremendous and, and impressive skill to represent accurately the song of a particular species of bird, you would maybe be impressed for a moment but you would pretty quickly find it really tedious <laughs> and want the person to stop. Uh, but what do you guys think about that? Is that true? Does, and does anyone else have friends who just like learn how to do that stuff? Because I mean, I know a guy. <laughs> um, he's really into- I think I probably- uh... Sorry. What's that? Oh, I was just going to say, um, no, you're good. certain things are easier for the human voice to replicate, of course. Um, so mostly I actually hear him imitating like um, cat noises, um, I guess. <laughs> um, but he does a really good like chirping bird and like, um, I actually think there's something like it's a different kind of beauty, sure, but it's still rather interesting and impressive um, when a human can do that. And uh, it can serve a purpose too. I've like lost him in the woods and found him because of um, his ability to like project his voice and stuff. Yeah, that's interesting, but. Um... So is this really on the part of Kant? Is this a reason to suspect that the mimetic theory of art is missing something? Or uh, what do you guys think about that? This is really annoying me that I can't find it. <laughs> Well, and once you find it, we have to translate it too. <laughs> um, I think I have it more easily discoverable in Hegel, where he actually refers to Kant. I can find that. <laughs> 
I actually had a, an argument with an art teacher a couple of years ago um, in regards to the classes on Native American art. And she wanted to know the difference between, you know, like a, an actual authentic arrow that, uh, you know, some brave had carved something into versus, uh, you know, something that was made specifically for like a gift shop. And uh, my argument for it was that, you know, like the, the arrow that was decorated for the purpose of just being an arrow um, holds so much more value than the one that was made for the purpose of making a profit or even a statement. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I, that's not where my mind goes to it as far as the, um, you know, the, the mimesis, the, the, you know, mimicking something is, it, it's not being what that thing is. You're just mimicking it as opposed to the actual thing, like the actual bird song, um, you know, it's full of mystery and, and beauty and, and there's no way that we could ever answer, uh, answer it no matter how many times we try to dissect it by whoever standards we're using. Is it the authenticity or is it the fact that we can't ask the bird about the song or the, or the original crafter of the arrow? Like, what are you, what are you using it to hunt or, or what have you? Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of what I was uh, uh, saying to her. And I don't have the answer to it, of course. And I think that that's what gives it so much more beauty. Um, whereas when you can actually dissect something like, you know, all of these philosophers we're learning about have shown us how to do, it takes away that mystery to it, I guess. Good. Yeah. So you mentioned the word mystery. That's really helpful. When we hear a bird song, um, in terms of some recognizable or uh, trackable melody that we can draw pleasure from, um, there seems to be something when it comes to the peculiar enjoyment <laughs> that we draw from a natural scene in which we hear a bird singing, something mysterious about it, such that we are given some liminal access to a foreign world, as it were, <laughs> the world of birds and how they communicate with one another um, or how they relate to each other and the natural milieu in which they find themselves and so forth. Um, and one imitating a bird song, however perfectly for, human ears, given that our originary relationship to a bird song itself involves this dimension or aspect of mystery. Um, the one who imitates, and this is putting us into a, a conversation again with Plato, right? The one who imitates uh, a bird song, even perfectly. So you, if you're just walking around, you might even mistake it if you didn't know better for the sound of a bird. Um, the one who imitates that perfectly is imitating um, what is the sensible, outwardly available uh, kind of shell of what is a kind of inexhaustible um, phenomenon uh, that has an important role beyond the aesthetic in the everyday reality of birds, for example. So a human imitator of birdsong um, if they're really good at it, all they're really depicting in their skill is the ability to imitate. And what that skill shows you is that um, the imitation to be successful when it comes to imitating something like a bird song just has to be good enough. <laughs> it has to be good enough to fool a naive hearer <laughs> or a naive uh, human listener. But notice that that status of being good enough to deceive as an imitation, um, the relatively inexperienced, because we don't really know the full depth of the commun communicative nature or capacity of these songs in the order of bird life, um, that good enough is pretty far from the truth. Um, and the truth really unfolds in the originary event of the song itself, so that when you are even just walking around outside or, or just sitting, whiling away the day, and you're deriving some kind of pleasure or, or um, amusement or enjoyment from the sound of a bird, even if this is the farthest thing from your mind, a part of that pleasure comes from the aspect of truth. Uh, that is, you're dealing with a reality here. <laughs> Whereas however perfect an imitation of the bird song might be, 
that perfection is just um, an approximation, which is good enough to fool you. And, and that's a good way to understand the problematic aspect of, 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 of morally, potentially morally corruptive art for Plato. You might see a sensuous representation of some ideal, such as the Homeric representations of the heroes and of the gods. Um, but uh, because what's being depicted is articulated through lines of human access, um, all the poet, in this case Homer, has to do is to fool you into thinking this is um, probable, right? This is something that makes sense. I can understand this in terms of what I'm familiar with in, in the everyday course of my life, my background experience, and so forth. Um, but that background experience that you're relying upon in your aesthetic appraisal is itself um, generated through various interactions and so forth um, from what you learn from others, your parents, for example, growing up, and for their part, what they know is achieved imperfectly through these sort of imitative relationships with others, with their parents and so forth. And then we get back to Ion here where we have a point of communicative attraction, like one iron ring to the other, we're simply transmitting imperfect representations that are getting farther and farther away from the true. And so that's the, the, the danger of artists who, to use the language of the sophist, don't know what it is that they're imitating. So they end up um, imitating imitations or producing representations of representations, um, just like the one who emulates the sound of, of a robin in spring, the bird song of a robin in spring, has no idea what each note indicates, right? Or what sense of being the song is communicating. Um, they're just sort of copying it. And so there's a kind of shallowness to that exercise, no matter how accurate or precise it might be for our imperfect hearing. Um, and so I found actually on page 414 where Hegel talks about this. So he says, there are portraits which as has been dryly remarked are positively shameless in their likeness. And Kant brings forward a further example of this pleasure and imitation pure and simple to the effect that we are very soon tired of a man, and there really are such, who is able to imitate the nightingale song quite perfectly. For we no sooner find that it is a man who is producing the strain than we have had enough of it, <laughs> he says. <laughs> we then take it to be nothing but a clever trick, neither the free outpouring of nature as we find in a bird nor yet even a work of art. Um, and so that's where Hegel on page 4, 414 is commenting um, on what Kant had said earlier and I couldn't find that quotation. If I find it um, later, I'll, I'll let you guys know, but um, does that make sense? All right. Um, so a couple of things though, I mentioned we, we should focus on some things that we haven't yet had time to adequately compass or make sense of. And so um, since we're recently dealing with Hegel, uh, I'll turn to Hegel, but then when it comes to Kant, I wanna spend some time today on what you wrote your reflection paper on, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and there's no confusion. So the role of aesthetical ideas in Kant, that's really important. Um, okay, so um, a couple things, and, and I wanted to mention this last time, but we ran out of time. So in connection to uh, excuse me, in connection to um, the three major epochs of art, so remember symbolic art, classical art, and then um, romantic art. There are some examples that are worthwhile working through or, or referring to. So what is the paradigmatic art form 
for classical art, according to Hegel. So which form or medium or genre of artistic production best captures what's possible in terms of classical art? Sculpture. Right. Good, sculpture. So I'll just pull up that slide real quick. So here's an example of classical Greek sculpture. And so remember when it comes to differentiating the various uh, historical modes or epochs of art history, um, we're dealing with the ideal and the material. Um, so some sensuous medium or sensuous material and then an ideal or let's say spiritual content. Uh, when it comes to classical art, the ideal spiritual content and the sensuous material medium are precisely uh, commensurate. So they work well with each other. So in this case, you have, when it comes to classical sculpture, you have a human bodily presence that is represented in three-dimensional form. And so that tells you that the material, in this case, we're dealing with um, stone, for example, marble. Uh, the marble is rendered commensurate or appropriately equal to the task of communicating a particular truth or ideal, because in this case, we're dealing with a body engaged in some sort of heroic action and bodies too, as we know, are three-dimensional, right? So there's a, a, a commensurate character between the two here. Um, but when it comes to romantic art, we're finding the, the spiritual idea somehow uh, exceeds the expressive capabilities of the sensuous medium or material form uh, in which it's delivered or uh, um, communicated. Uh, and so that's where we get to romantic art, right? So um, unlike classical art in which sculpture is the ideal medium, is the the perfect and emblematic medium. When it comes to romantic art, that would be music and painting. And we'll talk quite a bit about music as you'll see when we turn to Nietzsche, but this is an example of painting. So there's something of the spiritual content of the idea to be explored and expressed that is overwhelming, that's excessive, that's just too much. So here we're dealing with two dimensional forms um, which is a bit of falsity now in terms of how uh, the spiritual content and the sensuous materiality relate. Because of course we know um, that human bodies, as we saw in the previous slide, are three-dimensional, right? So there's something incommensurate there. There's something that's too much for uh, the, the material mode to accurately give us or to participate in. Um, so I wanted to, Oops, now use a couple of their examples just to make sense of this. So from our secondary textbook, The Gorilla Girls, uh, if you weren't already familiar with this famous figure, uh, Edmonia Lewis, um, does anyone remember the sculptor Edmonia Lewis from the recent chapter or, or perhaps um, you've seen it, seen some of her work before. Well, I was gonna pull up a sculpture of hers So remember, we should be able to, according to Hegel, in our effort to understand a historical people in their culture, um, some substantive cultural identity, we ought to turn first and foremost to their art, right? Um, so in this case, 
we can look at this 19th century sculpture as expressive of Geist or of uh, the developmental stage of spirit as realized within the material confines in terms of what's possible of the 1900s, or excuse me, the 1800s, so the 19th century. Um, so this is an example of that, right? So what is Edmonia Lewis then looking at her art, which is a kind of um, bit of diamond clarity in terms of the spiritual content to which we are as the viewers, as the consumers of art given access. So who can speak to the historical social reality um, that within this example of classical art dealing with sculpture is communicated to us? So what's going on in this um, work by Edmonia Lewis, so an African-American uh, sculptor or sculptress, you might say, from the 19th century? So how is, how is it that we in the 21st century are able to access this product of the history of art, as Hegel would understand it, the iterative or progressive unfolding of spirit? How are we able to take this point of access to a work of art that is historically removed from us now, we're centuries beyond this point, to gain, some, to gain for our part some sense, some understanding of of what the condition of human spirit was in the 19th century. So what does this tell us about that? Any ideas? But what do we see depicted here? We're just arguing about the like chains in the chat. Oh. Are they broken or do they just go through the earth and they're not broken? Well, I suppose that's a question, but you can also see chains on the wrist, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those appear to be broken. She doesn't seem to be very free, though. She's kind of like taking that stereotypical submissive kneel on the ground, um, hopeful look in her eyes, and he's just kind of, you know, like, oh, wow, I broke the chains or whatever. Yeah, so you mentioned hope. <laughs> Right? So there seems to be some inkling of hope and that's depicted in the upward gaze of both figures. Um, and you can also interpret that in terms of the intergenerational difference here. So uh, the emancipation or breaking of the, the bondage or chains of the older person is uh, a kind of pathway for a hopeful perception of the future on the part of the young. Um, but this tells you that, especially on the part of the one who produced this work of art, there was a sort of universal experience of unfreedom. Um, and at the same time, in response to that experience, a striving towards uh, the very possibility of liber liberation or emancipation. Um, and arguably once and for all, such that even greater freedom is opened up um, for the youth for those who would come later, right? Um, so that tells us about the experience of subjugation, oppression, marginalization, inequality, slavery, uh, that marked um, this, this terrible time in American history, given that we're confronting the work of an African-American sculptress. 
um, or sculptor, uh, Edmonia Lewis. Um, so does that make sense? So we can look at this artwork and we don't even need to read history books. We don't have to uh, be familiar with um, the accurate stories that incorporate or foreground different personages, different people. So we don't really know who this individual is that's represented or if it's even a particular figure at all that existed at some point. We don't need to know any of the real facts of the epoch um, to gain some understanding of what life was like. Uh, so what it meant to exist as a spirit within the unfolding of um, the evolution of Geist or spirit as human consciousness coming into self-consciousness. Um, okay, so does that make sense? But now I wanna share another sculpture this one is from the 20th century by uh, Umberto Boccioni. And so he is an Italian futurist who uh, sadly died very young um, in his early 20s, I think, falling off a horse in World War I. Um, in fact, <laughs> uh, something like 60% of the major Italian futurists actually died in World War I um, quite young. But um, so this is, um, just share the screen here. So here's a sculpture by Boccioni. Uh, and so I'm trying to show you through examples how um, the intent, let's say the spiritual intent of disclosure or revealing some truth some idea that wasn't presently available is too much in this case for the particular uh, material medium. Um, so this is obviously some sort of humanoid form or human figure, right? But it looks very strange. <laughs> uh, but does anyone have a sense of what the artist is representing here or uh, what they're trying to convey? So this is sculpture. It's a spatial material medium, which at least for our basic understanding of what the genre is capable of, doesn't involve time or temporality, unlike, for example, music or theatrical performance uh, or cinema, for example. Um, so similar to a painting, we're dealing with a static image or form uh, which is spatial and non-temporal. But what is the artist trying to show here, you think? It looks like some sort of disturbing, almost mechanical industrial creation marching into the future. That's that's what I got from it. Oh, Maybe awesome. I got that because you- I'm, I mainly picked up future. like perseverance. Because this poor sap has no arms <laughs> and is yet trudging onward. I saw it a little bit as um, kind of the discussion we were having a little while ago um, when we were talking about the templates or the forms of, um, and it's kind of like a more abstract maybe form of the physical human um, body as interpreted by like, um, like with the notion of having a higher soul in mind, like something more than human trying to like condense itself into the form of. Yeah, so all of that I think makes a lot of sense. The sort of abstraction of experience in terms of what human bodies are capable of and what we understand in virtue of our own experience as bodies. There's, so there's certainly this exploratory uh, abstraction at play in the work. Um, but similar to what cubists like Picasso were doing in the 20th century, uh, he's trying to represent, and so here's some kind of abstraction because it's an impossibility in terms of a static presentation of image, um, the dynamic quality of 
a body, in this case, a human body, but this relates to bodies as such, material compositions in time as such, the dynamic character of embodiment. Uh, and the futurists in other genres tried to play with this as well. Um, for example, through the medium of photodynamism. Um, and photodynamism was a kind of uh, proto cinematic medium that wanted to, in a static two dimensional representation or image, depict motion or movement uh, in time. So there's a famous image. Um, actually, I can just pull it up here. Let's see. So Giulio, <laughs> uh, another futurist, here's a famous photograph, an example of photodynamism called the slap, in which the, the act of a man slapping another man is represented, of course, in a photograph. So we're dealing with a static two-dimensional image, but where every progressive step and the unfolding of the movement is depicted, whereas that progressive change or transition um, is, is kind of uh, lost within a cinematic image. It's not all preserved simultaneously. Um, but there's something that even photodynamism doesn't capture yet about um, movement and dynamism in material forms. That is the way forms can deform um, or are deformed through being impressed upon by different forces in nature. So for example, uh, you're a body walking down the street, um, but there's an inscrutable sense in which if there's a lot of wind that day, the wind as it makes contact on your flesh is deforming that flesh. It's moving it about in ways that you don't see and that aren't immediately apparent. Uh, and that one could, one could try to represent or depict that in a static two-dimensional image, but it's going to fall short. Um, and so this is what motivates the innovation of previously impossible or unthought of artistic mediums or forms uh, such as photography or cinema. Um, so what I was getting at in showing these images is that there's something dissatisfying about the sculptural form, which can't really, despite the artist's most innovative, creative and sophisticated efforts, get accurately or depict in any satisfying way uh, these dynamic aspects that are trying to be shown or represented. Um, and so that gives way, for example, then to romantic art, uh, because there's something that falls short in terms of the iterative progress of spirit as it's coming to know itself through the institution of art, this trans-historical trans institution of art, uh, that the previous um, law, uh, um, kind of um, not necessarily obsolete, but waning in centrality of importance, older art forms are falling short of. Uh, Donnie, yeah, you have your hand up. Do you want to say yeah, something? Just for, uh, for that last sculpture that you showed, um, the word fluid came to mind when I was looking at it. Like it almost looks like, uh, you know, if the legs, the arms, everything, it, it's, uh, it's, like caught in a state of of flux, like it's constantly moving, and it just kind right. of snaps a picture of it. And, you know, that's that's just what I got out of it. I wanted to get that out. There. That's perfect. Yeah, that's that's precisely what Boccioni was exploring through his sculpture there, um, and it's also what I mentioned Cubism, what Picasso explores, and also what Boccioni does in several of his paintings, where he tries to capture the simultaneity of perspective. Uh, which looks very chaotic if you examine some of his paintings, but there's a sense in which the way you, so there's a famous painting of his uh, where it's an old woman leaning out of a balcony at a window looking at the street, uh, but there's a weird confusion of the forms such that in a way the perspective of the woman from the balcony onto the street is um, problematized and expanded by the very perspective or point of view that she assumes or takes for granted that would be possible for her if she were a person on the street looking up at the balcony. 
So there's this weird way in which, um, from your point of view, even if it's implicit in the background, you're drawing on every possible point of view to make sense of the object that you're seeing. Uh, and so the artist will try to capture that in a way that ultimately falls short of the ideal owing to limitations in the physical materials or the medium that made that art possible. And so this will, through the work of spirit or genius, to use again, um, th these technical terms of Kant and Hegel, uh, would generate new art forms. Um, and that's why there are many new art forms that we can anticipate or perhaps can't anticipate that will be wholly taken aback by that can emerge in the future that would perhaps um, supplant these older, um, now relatively obsolete mediums or art forms. Okay. Um, so any questions about that? Um, so now, what about aesthetic idea or aesthetical ideas? Let me pull up my Hegel. Um, I already have it up. But let me just show this, this painting. So this particular slide, this is uh, um, a painting by William Blake called Jacob's Ladder. So I was kind of briefly talking to Owen about this after class last week. Um, but this is a good example. And so this is from the Hegel slides, but it's a good example to make sense of um, aesthetical ideas in Kant. And that's what you guys wrote um, your recent reflection paper on. So is anyone familiar with the concept of Jacob's Ladder? There's a really interesting film, <laughs> too. Uh, yeah, I know that it, the the like form of <laughs> Jacob's Ladder gets repeated in a lot of different uh, artists' work. Yeah, so biblically, mythically, the Jacob's Ladder is supposed to be the bridge between the realm of mortals and heaven, right? So Jacob's Ladder would be that through which uh, you ascend these various forms. So think of Diotima's Ladder of Love, for example. Um, but here we're dealing with Christian theology in particular to arrive at heaven, right? Um, so think about that. What ideas come up if we're considering a ladder to heaven or a staircase to heaven? So think of like the Led Zeppelin song, right? Stairway to heaven. Um, well, there's a lot of ideas at work there. Right, so there's this idea of heaven as a particular sphere of being that is essentially different from the world of mortals, right? Um, if we understand Plato, it's supposed to be in terms of our world, the sensuous material world that we occupy in space and time is an imperfect copy or representation of heaven. Um, heaven bearing the perfect and the ideal Whereas the material mortal domain is um, in every case, an approximation of that ideal that's destined to fall short. Um, and so we're dealing with heaven as timeless, as infinite, as eternal. And then we're dealing with the ordinary course of mortal experience as caught up in time, as perspectival, as limited, and so forth. Um, and so uh, we find those ideas, so the idea of time, the idea of infinity, the idea of perfection, we find them played with and represented or depicted for us in an external sensuous form or series of images. Um, but any sensuous image in which, for example, the idea of infinity is represented is always going to be deficient in terms of capturing that idea, right? Because the very concept of the infinite necessarily in its essential substance transcends or goes beyond 
what's possible in the course of our finite everyday experience. So in the effort to present or to express this idea of the infinite, the artist will find recourse to this or that sensuous form, which will encapsulate it. And once you see that form, so you see this notion of infinity being played with, um, you don't see it and say, oh yeah, okay, that's the infinite. I guess I, I'm done. I don't have to look at this painting anymore. Uh, so it doesn't work like a concept does in the counterpart to this aesthetical idea, which for Kant would be uh, a rational idea. Um, instead, whatever you determine in your perspectival engagement with the sensuous presentation of the idea in a painting, like this one from Blake, for example, is just an ongoing impetus or invitation for you to continue thinking about that idea uh, by the material supplied in an imagistic way through the efforts of the artist. So that's why you can come back to a painting like this at different times of your life or actually gaze upon it for many minutes on end. And uh, your imagination is put to work in such a way that it's playing with. Um, and this is unique because the imagination is grounded necessarily in sensuousness and what's given to us through the intuition, but it's playing with this idea in an open-ended way. Um, whereas the rational idea of the infinite, which is the counterpart to the sensuous idea, which an artist can explore or pay, play with, uh, would just be the concept of infinity. So how does that come out of our everyday experience? Well, um, when it comes to a rational idea, the concept outstrips the possibility of experience. It exceeds the possibility of experience. But when it comes to an aesthetical idea, um, there's something given in the sensuous form that we can experience, in this case, visually, that outstrips or exceeds the bounds of the rational concept. So, um, for example, because of my experience as a being in time that uh, is really constituted in part in terms of my being, in terms of what I am through temporality, through time. In short, time is essential for making sense of what it means to be um, insofar as we're talking about the kind of beings that we are. Yet, I have never experienced the infinite. I have no possible experience of the infinite. Um, so for Kant, um, idea is a very special concept. Um, it's a kind of concept, but it's a concept understood as a vehicle for our thinking, whereby we are transported beyond the rigid confines of what's possible in terms of our understanding. Um, and the understanding for Kant is um, necessarily reliant upon concepts, which are a priori, and experience. Um, so what's given to me through my intuition. But the infinite is never anything that can be given to me through my intuition, because it's not something that's possibly experienceable by myself or really any kind of being that can experience anything. Yet, because I have lived, and I have lived from one moment to the next, and beyond my own self, I live in history, which means I understand that my parents came before me and their parents came before them and so on, to the farthest, most obscure reaches of our distant past, and I can imagine the generations which will occur subsequent to me, I am compelled in my thinking to go beyond my experience and to at least think about, for example, what went on in the world when there were dinosaurs <laughs> roaming the earth, or what went on at the moment of the Big Bang. I can't experience any of that, which means for Kant, as a scientist, for example, I can't possibly know any of that, really. Um, I can develop hypotheses about those uh, phenomena, but I can never really know. That's why we have theories, for example, 
um, just like I can't know because it's beyond the possible experience of my life to um, enjoy the future. But in any case, I can think the future. So then ideas are concepts that take us beyond the limited scope of a possible experience. And so the rational idea then of the infinite comes out of my experience as a temporal being where I'm thinking about infinity, but I can't experience infinity. Yet the concept of the infinite um, is that to which my reason as a rational being goes and it ends up satisfying me. So I think, oh yeah, uh, the infinite. I just have this idea of what um, exists in an unending line into the past and into the future. That's the concept. And I can easily write it in a sentence that is defining it. And that definition can be given in a dictionary and I can communicate to, to you. Um, and you can say, oh yeah, I get it. I know what the infinite is. And then you're done with it. <laughs> Um, but that, that's the concept that is this kind of um, dictionary definition of the infinite, which, although drawing in its origin from the character of your experience, necessarily goes beyond the scope of that experience. But you can satisfy that hole in your understanding by filling it in, so to speak, with the concept. And then you're happy with it. You're done. You know what the infinite is. So that's the rational idea of the infinite. It's a concept that outstrips the possibility of our experience. But now let's flip that rational idea on its head. And we're trying to explore it or play with it or depict it visually, sensuously. And that's what William Blake is doing here in part um, with this Jacob's Ladder, uh, considering the infinite. So you can see how uh, the staircase goes beyond the framing of the image, so it keeps on going, right, into the heart of, of the sun, drawing from the sort of Neoplatonic framework at this point. Um, <clears throat> and so then, beyond the stability of the concept of the infinite, you can turn to this painting and um, you can play with the concept, but in a way that's more satisfying for your constitution as a sensory creature, as a sensible animal. Uh, so is that something, Donna, you have your hand up or is it just still up from before? Hey, sorry, this is up from before. Oh, okay. Um, but does this make sense to you guys? What the relationship is between um, a rational idea and an aesthetic, I aesthetical idea? So it's not as if each deals with a different content. So if infinity or eternity or something like that, or absolute being is a rational idea, it can't be represented through a sensuous idea. That's not the case. It's not the content that's different. It's the form that's different. So the one, when it comes to the rational idea is pinned down by a kind of linguistic definitional concept and then for the aesthetical idea, it's precisely that rational, definitional, linguistic concept, which isn't good enough, um, such that the sensuous presentation puts your imagination and your understanding to work to continue to feast, as it were, on the substance of the notion presented for your experience. Um, does that make sense? Are there any comments or questions about that? Okay, um, so one thing we can do is turn to, well, there's the death of art thesis. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, according to Hegel, of the three fundamental institutions through which spirit articulates itself in history, art, religion and science philosophy, um, art has been surpassed. So uh, when it comes to making sense of a particular um, religious experience or community, it's no longer to art 
in the first order that one um, directs their attention. Uh, so that was how primitive religion, for example, functioned. But now uh, we have, you know, different activities, um, different bits or pieces of historical inheritance that do that uh, strong work for us when it comes to religion, for example. Um, so that's something important. But then this concept of, of the notion um, or the concept. So it's translated to, all right, this is the slide I wanted to. So I ask, you know, what the fuck is the notion? Um, page 394. So this is one sentence, <laughs> this huge block of text. This is all one sentence. And um, for the little bit of time we have left, uh, we'll unpack the meaning of the sentence because it's really the key to understanding Hegel's romantic conception of the nature of art. So, um, where is it? Yeah. So let's just stay with this for a few minutes. So here's the sentence. This is from page 394. So and although, and although works of art are not thought and notion simply as such, so notion is translated from the grief, but an evolution of the notion out of itself, an alienation and fremdum of the same in the direction of sensuous being, yet for all that the might of the thinking spirit, Geist, is discovered not merely in its ability to grasp itself in its most native form as pure thinking, but also, and as completely, to recognize itself in its self-divestment in the medium of emotion and the sensuous, to retain the grasp of itself in that other, which it transforms but is not, transmuting the alien factor into thought expression, and by doing so, recovering it to itself. All right. So this is, is more of the, the kind of typical, incomprehensible, baffling Hegel uh, that the maker of that video that we watched next week, remember when he said <laughs> um, that Hegel wrote horribly? Well, uh, I don't know about that. Let's, let's try to see what Hegel's trying to do uh, with great difficulty with these ideas. Um, so let's break this down, but does anyone want to first offer an interpretation of what this means? <laughs> so he says that although works of art are not thought and notion simply as such, is he explaining how like no, the notion is what sort of initiates this process of becoming for the art through the the like self and the like thinking thing that is creating the art um so yeah the notion then i mean this is i think what you're getting at when you put it that way is uh kind of an originary impetus that incites the work of artistic production to unfold in the first place. Um, so that's the sense in which for Hegel, remember, art is one of these essential institutions that mark the evolution of the spirit through different historical epochs. Um, and so one way to put that is it's in art, just as in a different sense, we could say the same of religion and science and philosophy, that what he's describing here as the notion um, uh, comes out of itself to return to itself, <laughs> to achieve fulfillment in the sense of self-consciousness. Um, and that's a process that has to occur through different iterative steps in history. And we as historical consciousness or as representatives of historical consciousness can turn back to the different um, moments of that history to pull out elements of truth um, in furthering along the coming to self-realization or fulfillment of the notion. 
Um, but let's let's do some vocabulary breakdown for Hegel. Uh, so Begriff, further down on that same page, he, he gives us kind of surreptitiously, so without calling attention to it, a definition of Begriff or notion. For the notion, Begriff is the universal, which maintains itself in its particularizations, which covers in its grasp both itself and its other, and consequently contains the power and energy to cancel the very alienation into which it passes. So what I have in blue here are important vocabulary words that were, or technical terms that we're gonna define. Um, so a better way, as I put it here, a better way to translate begriff instead of notion, uh, which is difficult to understand, I think, in these contexts is concept. So griff in German means grasp, um, to, to grip or, or handle something. Um, or it could be through a kind of comprehensive apprehension or grasp to gather together something, to hold it into one. So think about how an object like an avocado is a, a gathering together of all of the various sensuous properties or qualities by which the presence of an avocado are indicated. Um, but then in German, the prefix B signif signifies an infliction where one party is doing something to another. So begriff means a living, actualized, comprehensive grasp of some range of phenomena. So for example, the concept avocado grasps together all of those properties, the green hue, the rough texture, the rich but subtle flavor, and other properties essential for my ability to think or to recognize an avocado. Um, and so then to, go, to continue with this, the concept in Hegel's technical sense is the totality or completion of that three-term dialectic that we talked about earlier, that we talked about last week. So this concept contains the terms of the opposition, which by themselves, so the thesis and the antithesis, being and non-being are abstract. So they're only made concrete when they're brought together into relationship. So the concept contains the terms of the opposition, the subject, the object, the organic and inorganic, the same and the other, being and non-being, but they're reconciled. Um, so human minds are involved necessarily in the different moments of this oppositional structure, but our finite experience never encompasses the whole, the reconciliation. So this is the sense in which because we are consciousness, we are somehow alongside of or separate from nature. And this is dissatisfying. So there's this kind of rift between consciousness and that of which we are conscious, including our own bodies as an example of material nature. So for this reason, we experience alienation. Um, nature in terms of our own body too, is something weird, it's something foreign. It stands over and against our consciousness. And so we find some sort of anxiety in this. Um, and then it's the cancellation or Aufheben, which is the synthesis, that third term in the dialectic where you have a thesis, it's opposed by some opposition or antithesis, and then they're reconciled in the synthesis. And it's in that reconciliation that we get um, this notion of the notion <laughs> or a begriff or the concept that comes to its full realization or self-actualization. And so now, I mean, we're out of time, but this is just to wrap up this idea real quick. Um, going back to Caspar um, uh, von Friedrich's painting, or excuse me, Caspar David Friedrich. Um, so this was that originary sentence, uh, original sentence that we were just working through, that we're still working through. Um, but think about it, in the sense of what Friedrich painted. So in works of fine art, the spirit externalizes itself in sensuous matter, like the artist who comes upon a boulder that blocks their path. So they break out the hammer and chisel, they turn it into a sculpture, right? So um, in this romantic painting, Caspar David Friedrich as spirit puts himself into the sensuous matter by means of paint, brush, and surface. Now, when I say he puts himself, 
It's not that he's doing a portrait of himself. He is investing his personal energies into these materials. Um, so he's putting his spirit, his thinking, his feeling life into the canvas, into uh, the images depicted on that surface. So this strange stuff, this canvas, this paint, uh, which is not you, it's a kind of negation of you, a negation of the painter here, Friedrich, it's now infused, you might say, with the spirit of Friedrich himself. So what was previously other, mere object, some alien sensuousness is now rendered the same. So Friedrich can now see himself in the painting and the painting itself contains Friedrich. So Friedrich's alienation in and from the object, so that canvas, that paint and so forth is canceled or overcome. Um, so does that make sense? What's going on there? <laughs> I want to make sure that I, I am getting it. Um, so is the notion sort of equivalent to just self-identification, like like Friedrich himself sort of is the notion because he's becoming a part of this other thing? Yeah, and that other thing, so here we're talking about external material nature, is um, infused, you might say, with the spiritual life of Friedrich himself, which, by the way, is for its part rem emblematic or representative of Geist um, and its trans-historical evolution. So we can see Friedrich there in his spirit represented in that painting, preserved hundreds of years after his death, but more than just Friedrich, it's giving us an image into 19th century life. So the way in which Friedrich is the same in some important respect to all other human consciousnesses which existed in that historical epoch. Does that make sense? <laughs> all right, cool. So we're out of time. I really apologize for that, but hopefully this session helped to make sense of some things that were left over from our previous discussions. Um, but uh, are there any final questions or comments? So we can continue with this on Thursday. We're gonna have class on Thursday. And so we can continue talking about this and other things. And um, uh, I'll give you guys a chance to uh, work on your papers a little bit in terms of coming up with a thesis and that sort of thing. Um, but all right, are there any final questions or comments? All right, well, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good rest of your day and um, yeah, take it easy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, see you.